morning. Good morning. Hey, we, you know, we need to get a little bit more rowdy uh, about the Lord because we are in love with our King. He's awesome. He loves us. He cares about us. Yes, we are having a wedding afterward. We're real excited about that. But welcome to the Way Congregation. We are glad that you are here. We're going to begin with the Shema. This is sort of our pledge of allegiance to our King. So if you would please stand and we will all do this together. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchuto, Leholam Vaed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is His glorious name. His kingdom is forever. Amen. And now we are going to do a, um, a, um, a version of the 18 Amidot. These, this, these are prayers that probably go back to about the time of Yeshua. Adonai Sfatai Tiftach Ufi Yegid Teilatecha. Adonai, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Avot. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Velohei Avoteinu. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God and God of our fathers. Baruch atah Adonai Magen Abraham. Blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Abraham. Gibor. Baruch atah Adonai Mechaye Hametim. Blessed are you, O Lord, who resurrects the dead. Kadesh et Hashem. Baruch atah Adonai Ha'el HaKadosh. Blessed are you, O Lord, the holy God. Bina. Baruch Ata Adonai, Honen Hadaat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who favors the knowledge. Chuba. Baruch Ata Adonai, Harot Se Bichuba. Blessed are you, O Lord, who desires repentance. Shlach. Baruch Ata Adonai, Hanun Hamarbe Lisluach. Blessed are you, O Lord, who pardons abundantly. Geula. Baruch Ata Adonai, Goel Israel. Blessed are you, O Lord, Redeemer of Israel. Rafua. Baruch Atah Adonai, Rofei Cholei Amo Israel. Blessed are you, O Lord, who heals his people Israel. Birkat Hashanim. Baruch Atah Adonai, Mevarech Hashanim. Blessed are you, O Lord, who blesses the years. Kibbutz Galiwot. Baruch Atah Adonai, Mekabetz Nidchei Amo Israel. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gathers the dispersed of his people Israel. Birkat Hadim. Baruch Atah Adonai, Melech Oheb is a Daka Mishpat. Blessed are you, O Lord, King who loves righteousness and justice. Zadikim. Baruch Atah Adonai, Mishan, Umiftach le Zadikim. Blessed are you, O Lord, who supports and safeguards the righteous. Binyan Yerushalayim. Baruch Atah Adonai, Bone Yerushalayim. Blessed are you, O Lord, Builder of Jerusalem. Malchut ben David. Baruch Atah Adonai, Matzmiach Keren Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the horn of salvation to flourish. Tefillah. Baruch Atah Adonai, Shomea Tefillah. Blessed are you, O Lord, who hears prayers. Avoda. Baruch Atah Adonai, Hamachsir Shekinato Lezion. Blessed are you, O Lord, who restores his presence to Zion. Modim, Baruch Atah Adonai, Hatov Shimcha, Ulecha Nea'e Lehodot. Blessed are you, O Lord, the good one is your name, and you are proper to thank. Sim Shalom, Baruch Atah Adonai, Hamevarech et Amo Yisrael Be Shalom. Blessed are you, O Lord, who blesses his people Israel with peace. Yehu l'ertzon imrei fi ve'higyon libi lefanecha Adonai tzuri ve'goali. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Let's worship.
you're upstairs, but if you are, I could use just a little more vocal in this monitor up here. Thank you.
Lord and King, how good it will be when every knee bows and every tongue confesses. Lord, when the people see your face. Lord, we so look forward to that day. And God, we are so grateful that you are meeting with us today. Lord, we invite your presence here because we love you, we adore you. We are so grateful for another breath to praise you. really good, isn't it? Going from death to life. That's what we're singing about this morning. Deliverance 
possible to use them all for the glory of the kingdom. Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. How good you are. We praise you today. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Amen, amen. Oh, God is good. God is so good. You know, I think we just, we need to spend time in worship because God is faithful. And um, when we do that, we begin to forget the problems we have and we get to focus on the solution, which is, of course, God. He's the one that we want to look to. We're going to uh, read uh, the Torah portion today. It's our tradition that we like to bless the Lord before we do that because we think the Torah portion is pretty awesome because it has the words of life. And uh, God wants to impart wisdom to us so that we could live according to his word. So uh, it's our tradition to stand. If you want to sit, you're certainly welcome to. But if you want to join us, please do. Baruch ata Adonai no ten ha Torah. Amen. Bless Adonai the Blesser. Blessed is Adonai the Blesser forever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all the nations and has given us your instruction. Blessed are you, O Lord, of the instruction. Amen. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day. All right, we're going to be reading Leviticus here. 13, 1 through 13. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man has on the skin of his body a swelling, a scab, or a bright spot, and it becomes on the skin of his body like a leprous sore, then he shall be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priest. The priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body, and if a hair on the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous sore. Then the priest shall examine him and pronounce him unclean. But if the bright spot is white on the skin of his body and does not appear to be deeper than the, the skin and the hair is not turned white, then the priest shall isolate the one who has the sore seven days. And the priest shall examine him on the seventh day. And indeed, if the sore appears to be as it was, and the sore has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall isolate him another seven days. Then the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day. And indeed, if the sore has faded, and the sore has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only a scab, and he shall wash his clothes, and he is clean. But if the scab should at all spread over the skin, and he has seen by the priest for his cleanness, and shall seen by the priest again, if the priest sees that the scab has indeed spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. Then the leprous sore is on the person, he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall examine him, and indeed, if it swells on the skin is white, and it has turned the hair white, there is a spot of raw flesh in the swelling, it is an old leprosy on the skin of his body, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean, and shall not isolate him, for he is unclean. And if leprosy breaks out all over the skin, and the leprosy covers all the skin of the one who has the sore from his head to his foot, whatever the, wherever the priest looks, then the priest shall consider, and indeed if his leprosy has covered all the body, he shall pre pronounce him clean who has the sore, and it is all turned white, he is clean. And then two kings. Five, seven through fifteen. 
And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter, read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks to quarrel with me. So it was when Elijah, the man that God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I have said to myself, I will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abba and the Pafar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have done it? How much more then when he says that you should wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And then Matthew, a lot of Matthews here. Wait, hang on. Eight, one through four. The mountain, great multitudes followed him, and he, behold, a leper came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When John had heard in prison that the works of Christ, he set up, set two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you have heard and seen. The blind see, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Oh, I feel like I skipped one. I guess I skipped one. That figures. All right. Eight. Why don't I find my marker? No. All right, I guess I'm done because I don't see my marker. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you, brother. <laughs> hey, let's bless the Lord again because God is good. All right. All right. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher natan lanu Torah temet Vechaye olam neta betochenu Baruch atah Adonai Noten ha Torah Amen Blessed are you Adonai our God King of the universe who has given us the true instruction planting within us eternal life. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gives the instruction. Adonai, amen. You may be seated. 
Uh, we're calling the kids now to come forward. We want to bless you kids because we think God is awesome for giving you to us. And so we want to do a special blessing over you. All right. So, yeah, the men would take the talit, the prayer shawl, as we pray over our little ones. Oh, that's funny. Where did our big one go? Oh, I guess it's uh, doing double duty at the moment. So, all right, we'll be really skinny, kids, okay? This is good. All right. All right, over our sons, we pray. Yevarech Adonai ke Ephraim umenashe, she timtsachen beine Adonai kol yame chayecha. May Adonai bless you like Ephraim and Manasseh. May you find favor in the eyes of Adonai all the days of your life. And over our young daughters, we pray. Yevarechech Adonai ke Sarah ve Rivka ke Rachel ve Leah ke Miriam em Yeshua she timsi chen beine Adonai kol yamei chayech. May Adonai bless you like Sarah and Rebecca, like Rachel and Leah, like Miriam, mother of Yeshua. May you find favor in the eyes of Adonai all the days of your life. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Hey Shabbat Shalom Hey Shabbat 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 Shalom Amen Jeff if you would do the announcements for us that would be awesome and uh, again, we are having a wedding afterward. We're really excited about that. Everyone's welcome to join us. And then following that, we're going to have the Oneg as usual downstairs. All right, Shabbat Shalom. I am going to have Carol Lee come up and talk about some very important things first. I like how roomy this is down here. This is great. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Um, Monday is the deadline to register if you want to come to the Passover Seder. We needed to have a cutoff so that we can make sure that we are well prepared for every one of you who wants to come. So they will be telling you about the app and how to sign up. If you need a scholarship or you need help, we do have provision for you, so come and see me sometime during the event after, and I will help you out. Um, women, um, because next Shabbat is the week before, just two days before our Seder, I'm not going to be able to meet with you, but we are dissecting the Seder plate. So if you're coming to the Seder, I have printed out a picture of what it is and what each one of those things on the Seder plate means. And I will bring them. They will be on the table at the back of the room next week. And you can take that and have a little bit of fun seeing what all those things on that plate mean. Okay? Let me pull up my doodad here. There we go. All right. So like she was saying, if you, if you still have not signed up, you can do so in the app. And that's not going to work. That's fine. Uh, you can do so in the app, or you can point your phone at the little code there. Um, and there's the app right there. Either way, if you point your phone there, it will take you to the app store if you don't have it, and you can download it. I'm happy to help you with it if you need help. You can also register there. Now, uh, as of this morning, there are 19 spots left for adults. So those have gone quickly. So if you don't have it yet, make sure that it... That you know, you make sure that you're not left out of that. And again, if you if you need help, if you need provision, if you need a scholarship, just talk to us. We don't want anybody to be left out of that. All right. And so, like we're saying, that's Monday, the 22nd. Next Shabbat um, is the third Shabbat of the month. That is when Shepherd's Pantry, uh, which is the food ministry of the River Church, is is doing their thing. So many of you have volunteered and gotten involved, and we think that that is fantastic uh, because it does promote unity uh, we in the river church though we may do things differently we serve the same king 
um, and we are serving the same community that we all live in. So thank you so much for being involved in that. Um, so there's no women's group. We are having Oneg slash wedding reception today. It is going to be a big, joyful day here with us, and we're glad that you're here. Um, and then Oneg and Midrash, of course, is on the second and the fourth um, Shabbats of every month. Uh, let's take just a minute before we, uh, we before we take a short break. Our vision at the way. Um, let's, there we go. Um, this is something that Doug and I worked and crafted together because we think that's kind of who we are. Uh, we aim to share God's kingdom of love, God's kingdom of love, with every soul and guide them in His instructions for life. We are we are citizens of a kingdom. Um, right now, it's we're citizens by faith. We have not seen the fullness of the kingdom yet, but we are rehearsing this when we come together and we hear the word, when we break bread, when we pray for each other, and when we love and serve the community around us. We are part of God's kingdom. Uh, and of course, with the kingdom um, comes a way of life in the kingdom, and that is what we hold scripture and what is what we hold Torah to be. These are the instructions for living in the kingdom. Um, and that is something that we think is very, very important, and we think is a, what makes us distinct as a congregation, is, is focusing on the kingdom and the king and the king's way of life. Amen? Um, I just saw a slide up there. I wanted to talk about Bible questions answered. Um, this is now called Pastor's Perspective. Same time, same channel, but this is something that uh, Pastor Doug and uh, Pastor Ed Doss down in Texas take the questions and, and not only expound on them through, you know, through knowledge and, and through stuff that you learn, but also from a pastor's heart. Um, and this is, a, I think this is a fantastic program. I hope you're able to check it out and join it. We also have Prophecy Roundtable every Thursday. And this is when Doug and Scott to get, get together and talk about all things end times, prophetic, signs. They had a great program on the, uh, on the eclipse last week. I hope you guys got to enjoy it. And finally, we have Hebrew Nation Radio Prayer Force. This is something that Carol Lee does. Um, and it's Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. on... Um, I can't read that. HebrewNationOnline.com. Um, if you need any details about that, please go speak with her. Uh, that's a very important part of her ministry, not only at The Way, but in this, in this world. Um, one way to get involved, of course, is through tithes and offerings. You can do that through the Tzedaka box, or you can do that online. And what this does is it puts you in a partnership with us, um, because whether you know it or not, right now, you guys here in the building are seeing this. There's people in this city seeing this. There's people in other countries around the world seeing this right here. And that's because of us partnering together uh, in all things, including tithes and offerings. So that's another way you can get involved. Let's take a couple of minutes and greet each other in the name of the Lord. And we will get into Romans 3 and 4.
All right, well, let's get started. Man, we got some great stuff today. I'm excited. Oh, God is good. All right. Hope you guys got some coffee or tea. Uh, we got the fans on as best we can. Uh, unfortunately, when you have a, a, a uh, swamp cooler, you have to unwinterize it, and we haven't done that yet, so uh, we'll, get it, we'll get up there. All right, let's pray. Lord, you are good. We thank you for the teachings of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the amazing lessons. Help us to put these in our hearts and to just walk with a, 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 a spring in our step because of all that you have done, Lord. We love you and praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, well, we've been talking about the kingdom, and I'm excited about the kingdom. When Jesus came to preach the good news of the kingdom of God, if somebody could have those doors left open, that would really make everybody happy, I think. So maybe... Um, so Jesus came preaching the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom is what we're excited about. And when we come to the book of Romans, we've, uh, we've been talking about this, how this is really a restoration of the kingdom. And there have been a few things that were, well, basically forgotten for roughly the last 2,000 years. Why? Well, there's a few answers to that. One was this guy uh, named Marcion. He was a second century heretic. Not a bad, not a, not a good guy at all. Uh, he definitely got us off on the wrong foot. But whoever's to blame, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that God is in the business of restoring. He's in the business of restoring. You know the basic story. God takes the children of Israel out of Egypt. They get married with a chuppah. So this is amazing right now that we can talk about this, right? There was a cloud above the mountain. Remember that? And they all said, yes, whatever the Lord has said, we will do. And so they entered into a marriage contract with him. Unfortunately, they were not very faithful. God is faithful, but they were not faithful. And so the marriage went down and down and down until finally God said, okay, I'm going to take the kingdom from Solomon and I'm going to give it to this guy named Jeroboam. Well, so he said, okay, you got the kingdom. And then it went down and down and down until God said, you know what? It's over. We're getting divorced. It's not working out between us. So that happened about 722 B.C., and he said, okay, you're no longer my wife. I'm no longer your husband. But one day, one day, I will bring you back to me in righteousness, and I'll betroth you to myself. I'll betroth you. You will be my woman. Now, that kind of got lost in some of our theology over the last couple thousand years. And we've had essentially this theology of the church versus the Jews. But what God is doing is he's putting it all back together. He's putting that broken kingdom of Israel back together. It was spoken of throughout the prophets again and again and again. So the Apostle Paul, he writes to the church in Rome where there's about 50,000 Jews living there. They're practicing the laws of Moses. They uh, are into, you know, the Torah and all this other stuff. And then there are some Romans who are like, you know, we kind of like this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's really awesome. We want to know more about him. How can we join? And so there was only one way to come in. That was to become Jewish, essentially, if you wanted to become in covenant with this God. Or you could just be a righteous Gentile looking from the outside. Of course, then along comes Yeshua. And Yeshua does an amazing work. And Paul is really the preeminent scholar who said, oh, oh, I get it. I get it. And the majority of his writings are really about this theme. It's about the restoration of these two houses back into one so that there would not be two nations ever again, but they would be one in God's hand. And so now we come to Romans 3 and 4. Romans 3 and 4. Pivotal stuff. Amazing stuff. And as I was going through this, this passage, it just came to me that, you know, God hasn't changed. I grew up hearing that God basically had changed. You know, he had the Old Testament before. He kind of had this way he was doing things with the Jews. And he gave them the law. Here, try that for a couple thousand years and see how you like it. And then Jesus came along and said, ah, we don't need to do that stuff anymore. I got this nicer way. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Now I'm into grace. Now I'm into grace. Because God wasn't into grace before. That's, that was the, the message that I heard growing up. But I want to show you back 
at that time when Israel and God got married. And Israel, right after they had said, we do, we'll do all that the Lord has said to do, we'll be faithful, we'll be his wife, and all these things. What did they do? They went after the golden calf. And it went from bad to worse. And so then Moses has the audacity. He says, show me your glory. He says, okay, fine. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over you. And then I'm going to pass by and you can see my back. And I'll pull my hand away. And then I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. And he does. And he says, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. Yehovah, Yehovah, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in loyal love and faithfulness, keeping loyal love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is who God is. When Jonah went to Nineveh, he's like, I don't want to go because I know that God is gracious and abounding in goodness and truth. And then he forgives. God hasn't changed. And so what Paul is going to be talking about in these two chapters is that same God, the God who doesn't change. Now, this is one of these debates that we have. We on the Messianic Torah keeping side of things are like, well, the law, it's important. And it is. It really is important. But then, you know, some of our Sunday brothers say, no, no, grace is important. And that is important too. So it's really simple. When you understand that it's the horse and cart scenario, which one comes first? Well, the horse, of course, right? The horse is going to pull the cart. If you, if you get the cart before the horse, it doesn't work out very well, and the whole thing just goes off into the ditch. So the law doesn't make one righteous, but a righteous man keeps the law. And that's essentially what Paul's talking about. It's not by keeping the law that we're saved is that we're saved and now we want to keep the law. It's really simple, isn't it? Guys, I'm not so foolhardy. I've been, I've been accused of, you know, somebody said, oh, Doug, you know, another pastor called me. He said, you're, you're going to hell. I'm like, really? Wow. Because you're teaching people, you're putting people under the law that they have to keep the law to be saved. Guys, I want to make it crystal clear for you. We are not keeping the law to be saved. We are not so dumb. We really aren't. I tell you, if you're banking on that, if that's sort of your, your strategy, good luck to you. I'm not. My strategy is, I'm in need of your mercy, Lord. I'm in need of your grace. But I don't want to use that as a license to do things. I want to do the right thing. And so, yeah, we study the word so that we can know it. And we can do what it says, no more. No less. But we understand that we are people who have failed. We have broken his commandments. And so we're banking on his grace. Now in the first century, uh, an, uh, an issue came up. We read about this in Acts 15. It, this uh, thing came up. It said, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, there was a debate within first century Judaism, not Christianity. Within first century Judaism, there was a debate about how somebody came into the faith of Judaism. And there were a couple different schools of thought. Down in Alexandria, they were a little more liberal than the Jews living in Jerusalem. And the Alexandrian Jews said, no, no, no. All you have to do is you would, you would, they would admit Gentiles after having undergone the rite of baptism, that is the regeneration by living waters, which was said, wash your whole stature clean from impurity and running streams and with hands uplifted to heaven. Ask for forgiveness for your doing. Then the worship of God will heal gross impiety. So if you were an Alexandrian Jew and some Gentile came and said, Hey, I want to be one of you guys. What do I have to do? What do I have to do to be saved, to be part of your community? They said, look, just get baptized and ask for forgiveness. And then worship God. And that will take care of it. And that is... Um, what was also iterated by 
Rabbi Joshua, he said that the baptismal rite rendered a person a full proselyte without circumcision. They just had to be baptized. But the more stringent school, Rabbi Eliezer, he said, no, that it was a circumcision was a condition for the admission of a proselyte. So you first had to be circumcised in order to be part of this covenant relationship. Well, guess where the, pro guess where the disciples landed on this discussion? Well, obviously they said, no, no, no. You don't have to do all these things. They said, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which we either, which neither we, our fathers, nor we were able to bear? Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. From Moses, the Torah has been taught throughout many generations. Those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And so this is all they had to do. You just had to say, I'm not going to go after those false gods anymore. I'm going to go after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that was what brought you in. It's always been about grace. It has always been about grace. So as Paul begins this discussion, he talks about circumcision. In chapter 4, he's going to really talk about it. And I 100% agree with Paul. I think Paul had it absolutely right. And we're going to, we're going to discuss here today as, as well that there are even some people who, in the messianic circles who, who begin to reject Paul because they think that Paul was anti-Torah. He was anti-law. And that is so far from the truth. So um, I, I had to give you sort of that preamble because the book of Romans is, is thick. It's dense. Uh, I can't just teach it and say, oh, that was easy because there's a lot to consider in here. We're going to go relatively fast, but I'm hoping that we can really understand some of these concepts. Okay, so Paul says, what advantage then has the Jew or what is the prophet of circumcision, the circumcision, which is the Jews, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God, right? So we see that this term, the circumcision, is used to speak of the Jews. He says, for what if someone did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So look, there is an advantage because God gave the oracles through them. They safeguarded them. And I, I just want to make it really clear publicly. I keep hearing of Messianics, Hebrew roots, people that are denouncing the Jewish people that become very anti-Semitic. I think it's terrible. I think it should not happen. I stand with the Jewish people. I stand with Israel. They're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But they're good people. And we're going to stand with them because God is standing with them. And so he goes on, if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust to inflict wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? Now, what is he getting at here? He's saying, look, he's called the Jewish people as much as he's called Israel. We're going to talk about that. But he, he, he's discussing that, look, the Jews as, as a corporate whole are definitely in God's favor. But individually, some of them haven't done so hot. That's basically what he's getting at. And he's going to later say in Romans 11, if somehow I could provoke my people to jealousy and save some of them, he says, for if their rejection, remember, the Jewish people as a corporate whole, as a national entity, rejected the Messiah. Individually, though, many of them accepted the Messiah, such as, I don't know, Paul, right? He's a Jew, right? Uh, Peter, he was Jewish. James, Jacob, right? He was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish, you know. There's a lot of Jews that believed in the Messiah. There were tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands. Some estimates put it even up to a million people in the first century. A million Jews believed in the Messiah. So to suggest that they didn't believe in Messiah on an individual level is incorrect. But as a corporate, on a corporate level, they didn't. It's just like, you know, we all may have an opinion about something, but what happens in Washington, D.C. is what sets the course for our country. We may or may not agree with those decisions, but it's not really our decision to make, per se. 
So if the, the national rejection on the part of, of Judah rejected the Messiah, if that national rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what does he mean here? Because when they rejected the Messiah, this is from Psalm 118, that the, build, the stone that the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this was, this is, says, this was the Lord's doing. And this was marvelous in our eyes. This was the Lord's doing. So somehow Jesus had to be rejected by his own people. And he says, if, if that was reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance of Yeshua be but life from the dead. And it will be at that time that the resurrection happens. I can hardly wait. So God uses our choice, but he does not predetermine them. This is what Paul's getting at. Okay, so you make a bad decision, but God's still going to work it out. Does that mean that I should continue making bad decisions? No. God can use your bad decisions. He doesn't make you make those bad decisions. He doesn't predetermine what your decisions are going to be. And you will still face the consequence and the pain and the suffering of that bad decision. But God can still use it in a way that's good. He says, for if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Right? So in chapters 1 and 2, he's laying out this case that, look, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your pedigree. We've all blown it. Every one of us has blown it. And we can't stand and say, well, I've got the Torah. God gave this thing to me, and so I'm, I'm good that I'm somehow shielded. No. You're still required to do the things that are written in the Torah. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no, none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery in their ways and the way of peace they've not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. This is Paul quoting King, King David to say, look, nobody's got it right. There's no one who is truly 100% good all the time. That would include, I don't know, Abraham. That would include Moses. That would include, of course, King David, who was very forthcoming about his failures. And if they were in need of God's grace and they acknowledged that it was by God's grace, how much more should we, who probably don't rise up to their level, also say it's about grace. It's by grace, through faith, that we come to God. Notice here in Ezekiel, God is bragging to Ezekiel. He says, look, if, if these three men were here, only they would be delivered. Noah, Daniel, and Job. Only they, because of their righteousness, would, would make it. And so, yes, there is a place for righteousness. We want to pursue righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is righteousness? It's just right living. It's doing the right thing. It's what is true, what is good, what is pure. Those are the things that we want to pursue. This is uh, one of my favorite authors, James Allen. Uh, he says, the righteous man is invincible. No enemy can possibly overcome or confound him. The unrighteous man is vulnerable at almost every point, living in his passions, the slave of prejudices, impulses, and ill-formed opinions. He's continually suffering, as he imagines, at the hands of others. The slanders, attacks, and accusations of others cause him great suffering because they have a basis of truth in himself. The partially righteous man is vulnerable at all those points where he falls short of righteousness. And should the righteous man fall from his righteousness and give way to one sin, his invincibility is gone. For he has thereby placed himself where attack and accusation can justly reach and injure him because he's first injured himself. We often think that we're doing righteousness for God's sake, but you're not. You're doing righteousness for your sake. 
It's for your sake. It's for your benefit that you do the right thing. Because you will be the one ultimately who will receive what you sow. What you sow is what you're going to reap. Paul goes on. Obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to bring the entire world into judgment before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In John, we know that the definition of lawlessness or sin is lawlessness. What is sin? It's lawlessness. It's really simple. Sin is to just miss the mark. What is the mark? The law. What is the law? It's God's values. It's God saying these are the things that are good. These are the things you should pursue. These are the things that will lead to life, peace, prosperity, joy. And if you decide by your own free will to not follow these things, then you will be taking part in the curse and the things that lead to death and pain and sorrow and hurt. It's your choice. Some years ago, I commissioned a man to make some little graphics for me because I, I thought, you know, there must be a, a way to illustrate what it is about keeping the law. So imagine you're walking on a precipice and there are these signs that caution, watch out. You could fall. Loose rocks. Watch out. Be careful, right? Now, do, do those signs save you? Eh, not necessarily. But what do they do? They, they warn you of danger. And that's what the law is. The law cannot save you. It can warn you. Be careful. Watch out here. There's, there's loose gravel. And you could fall a thousand feet if you're not careful. The law says, careful. Watch it. Right? Danger of falling. Violation of the law will result in death. Avoid the edge. Loose gravel ahead. Right? And as long as you stay away from that, you're safe. As long as you heed the warnings, you're safe. But what happens if you get a little too close? You're like, well, it's not so bad. Ah! And you begin to fall. Now, as you're falling, you're falling, you're looking up, and you're thinking, you know, I should have kept the law. I should have done what it said to do. I should have been smarter to stay away. You know what? I repent of it. I'm sorry I didn't follow the law. What can the law do for you at that point? As you're falling to your death? Nothing. The law is powerless to save you. It can't do anything for you. When you were on top of the, the ledge, it said, be careful, watch out. And if you were sorry, you're like, okay, that's good advice. I'm going to stay away. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But once you're falling, having a change of heart, saying, man, I should have kept the law. If I could do it over, I, I would. It's, I'm sorry, it's too late. You're falling. You're going to die and go splat. I'm sorry. That's just the reality. So what do you need at this point? What do you need? You can't say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry that I broke the law. You know, I should have kept the law. I'm going to keep the law. You know, that's not enough. You need someone to save you. You need a big hand to come and say, I got you. And as he's putting you back up and say, yeah, thanks, Lord. I, I deserve that. No, you didn't. He deserved to go splat. But in his, in his grace... And his abounding goodness, he said, I don't want my child to die. And so I'm going to put my hand out and catch them before they go splat. So that they will not suffer. And as he puts you back up on the ledge, what should your response be? I'm going to get close to the ledge again and just see what happens. I'm going to jump off and see how this is going to work out. He's like, you know, it's not a good idea. Because I saved you. Because you had broken the law, and I saved you as that from that. The law could not save you. So it's always been by grace. Nobody has ever lived who was perfect in every single way without any kind of flaw, whether that's physical or moral. Nobody. 
Not one. Everyone has fallen. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You guys see it now? It's, it's, do we want to keep the Torah? Of course. The Torah says, hey, be careful. There's a ledge here. You could fall. And it's not good to fall. It's better to live. I say, yes, amen. But it's not through the keeping of the commandments that I can be saved. Because in some way or another, I've already fallen. In one way or another, I've already blown it. If you think that you've arrived, come talk to me. We'll do a little quiz to see how you're doing. Because all of us have blown it in one way or another. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So from the beginning of time, mankind had been breaking God's commandments. And God said, okay, I'm just not going to deal with that right now. I'm going to make a way. My hand is going to come and I'm going to save people. And he did that through Yeshua. So that he could demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just at the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. Or by what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, to the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Now I was looking at this and if we look in, the, in the, the book of Habakkuk and we look in the Greek, it actually says that the one who, um, but the person of integrity will live because of his faithfulness. That's the word ekpisteos, the same that, that Paul uses here. And this is, of course, where he's drawing from. So yes, there, there, you, know, you, will, you will live, you will enjoy the goodness of God by, by keeping his commandments. Absolutely. I don't mean in, in the eternal sense. I mean in this life. If you, if you do what God says to do, you will get to enjoy the blessings of keeping that. And then the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, through faith. Either way, it's through the Lord that we are coming. Now, Paul is talking about uh, how the Gentiles are coming to faith. That's us. Unless you're born Jewish, that's awesome. I was not. But what part do I have in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do I have to become Jewish or to become circumcised so that I can become part of this? No, I don't. Do I have to take on the Torah and prove that I can do it? No. This is good news. But it's always been the same good news. It's, it's, a, it's a misinterpretation, a misteaching that somehow God expected the Jews to keep all these things and then maybe they could be saved. God never said that. God has not changed whatsoever. But now he's bringing you, once Gentiles, which was scattered Israel out of covenant, can now come in and be part of the commonwealth of Israel. No longer strangers from the covenants and promises, but now fellow citizens. And so we rejoice in that. Well, he then asked this question. Do we then abolish the law by this faith? Of course not. He said we uphold the law. It's just understanding what is the role of the law. The law is the warning sign saying, watch out, be careful. And as long as you heed those, you'll be okay. But nobody's heeded those. Not perfectly anyway. And so, yes, we want to keep them because they'll lead to blessing in this life, for sure. But no one has been able to do it. Now, this is where sometimes some of the anti-Paulists, uh, they're really fighting Marcion. Now, if you were not here about a month ago when I talked about uh, Marcionism, he's sort of that ghost of the machine. 
He's the haunted house. He's the one that's kind of messed up a lot of our theology. I'd encourage you to go back and to listen to that. So I debated a man some years ago named Laverne. Uh, Laverne was a, is a, a Torah keeper. And he wanted to debate me. I thought, okay, fine. I'd love to. He, he was arguing that Paul is a false teacher. I was arguing that Paul's the real deal. That we should stick with Paul. And so something that he wrote to me in an email, he said, Paul taught the law was torn down and that we are no longer under it. I radically disagree. And he was surprised that I could believe in Paul and keep the Torah at the same time. He's like, I, he'd never met somebody that could do that. I said, well, because the law is good. The law is good. And what, look what Paul said. I confess to you that according to the way, it would be a great name for a church, um, the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So we stand with Paul. The trouble is that many people, when they think of Paul, at least some people on the Hebrew roots, Messianic side, they think Paul that was against the Torah. But that's because they've been fed a version of Paul that's coming through this guy named Marcion. And so it's, it's Marcion's version of Paul that many people have been taught. And as I shared several weeks ago, there are many people today who are behind pulpits on Sundays generally, and they're teaching a Marcionistic version of Paul. And that's very unfortunate. And so what I would suggest that they're kind of like Don Quixote and they're going after uh, windmills thinking that they're giants. Paul is not the problem. Marcionism is the problem. Marcionism is the problem. So again, if you didn't watch that teaching, I encourage you to go back and to check that out. Okay, so Paul now gets to Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he's got something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from the works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. David said that. Now, did David know something about sinning? He certainly did. He stole another man's wife. He then killed that man, tried to cover it up. And he finally said, oh my, <laughs> I'm in trouble. As I've sinned. And he realized that it was about God's grace. Because it's always been about God's grace. God hasn't changed. I think that's really good news. And it's through faith that we come to him. It's through the work of Yeshua. And what Paul is telling us is, it's not that God took shortcuts. He's like, I don't worry about it. It's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. And God sent Yeshua to be the propitiation, to be the one who would pay that penalty. Now, there's a lot that could be said about that. We went through the entire book of John and we talked about that. So I don't have time to get into all that this morning. But understand that, yes, Yeshua, Jesus, did die for my sins. <clears throat> he died and he rose again. And I believe by faith in him and I will be saved so King David got it Paul goes on does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only that would be the Jews uh, to use that vernacular or upon the uncircumcised also for we say that the faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness how then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised. So if you know the story, this is in Genesis chapter 15, right? So chapter 12, God calls Abraham, Lech Lecha, you know, take yourself, go to a country that I will show you. Get out of your father's homeland. So Abraham goes. And then in chapter 15, God says, Abraham, come here. See the stars? Yeah. Your descendants are going to be like that. And Abraham's like, I don't have any descendants at the moment. None. Will, 
Will uh, Eliezer Ben Damesek, will he be my, my heir? Is that what you're talking about? Are you saying that my heirs are going to be the, uh, my, my servant, this, this son of, da of Damascus, Eliezer? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. No, he's, he's not going to be the heir. From your own body. Yeah, Lord, but I'm about 100. And Sarah's like 90. Yeah. Through you guys. Your descendants will come. And he's like, hmm. Okay. Sure. Why not? I mean, if God said it, that's good. And it says that he believed. Now at that point, it was still another two chapters before God would introduce the right of circumcision. So what Paul is getting at here is that when Abraham believed, he was not yet circumcised. So he had not done anything in the physical, in the flesh, to somehow prove his worth or show that he was keeping God's commandments. It wasn't through those things, but it was by faith that he believed. So Paul is not trashing circumcision. He's saying circumcision is not the means by which you come into the covenant. Torah or any kind of law keeping is not the way that you come into a covenant relationship with God. It's simple. It's faith based on God's grace. That hasn't changed and it never will. He says, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So you don't have to do something to come into the relationship with God. You simply have to come in through faith based on his goodness and his grace and his mercy. It has always, always, always been about this. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? I think I just read that, sorry. So uh, we see though that circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. He says, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. This is good news, guys. Because I tell you, as much as I want to keep the Torah, I want to do with the things that God has said to do, I kind of mess up on a daily basis. I get mad at somebody, I lose my patience. I think things that I shouldn't. And, and so I find myself just crying out to God for his mercy. And saying, God, thank you that it's about your grace. Thank you it's about your goodness and your faithfulness. Not mine. As much as I'm, I'm trying, but I'm also failing. And so I'm, I'm banking on his goodness. He says, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there's no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As is written, I've made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead, right? Mechaye metim, right? We read that this morning. And calls those things which do not exist as though they did. It's one reason we do the 18 Amidot, because they're ancient prayers. And you can hear them interspersed in the writings of the apostles, right? Who gives life to the dead. Mechaye hametim. That's exactly the phrase that we said this morning. So what is this? Uh, this, this, you know, if, if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. What is he talking about here? The law brings about wrath. Is the law bad? No, he just said, no, we should establish the law. We establish it. But once you have a posted sign, hey, keep out, posted, no trespassing, 
Now you know. Right? So if you're just walking along and some guy says, hey, what are you doing on my land? You're like, oh, man, I didn't know. I didn't know it was your land. Uh, do you have a, a, a no trespassing sign? No, I don't. Oh, well, you know, I'm really sorry, but I didn't know I was trespassing. I thought this was public property. Well, then you could have an excuse. But if the fact that it says no trespassing, no trespassing, no trespassing, and you're like, huh, no trespassing, huh? Well, let's just see about that. And you go in. Now you're guilty. Now you, you're held accountable because you know. Because it was written. And that's what Paul is getting at here. It's not merely that it's in, in the heart that, you, that we should know because of our conscience, which we should. But God's like, you know what? You guys keep messing up. You keep fighting. I'm guessing we have to just write it down. Was there ever a time when your kids just kept fighting? You're like, can you guys just stop fighting? And they won't. So they're like, you know what? I'm going to write some house rules and put them on the fridge. No fighting. So now it's been, it's been written down. Now they know you can't fight. They should have known anyways because they should just love each other. This is what we think as parents. This is what God's thinking. He's like, hey, can't you guys just get along? Can't you just love each other? No. Fine. I'll write the rules down and I'll put them on the cosmic fridge. Okay? So that you know what I'm expecting. I'm sorry I had to write these things down. They should be in your heart, but they're not. So I'm going to write them here and you can see what they say. Please do those. That is what God would have us do. And so who, contrary to hope, speaking of Abraham, and hope believed so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old, the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him as righteousness. So Paul's taken us through a little bit of the, 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 the mental process that Abraham had. He's like, I have kids at this age, and, and my descendants are going to be like the stars of the heaven? Okay. I mean, sure. If that's what you're saying, God, then I'll trust you. And God said, that's all I need. That's all I need from you. You don't have to do the heavy lifting. That's all I need. Now, I've shared with you guys before this guy named Charles Blondin. He was probably the greatest tightrope walker of the 1800s. I, I love the story. Because he's going back and forth. He put a tightrope across Niagara Falls, 1,100 feet across. And he's going back and forth. He's taking a wheelbarrow. He's cooking an omelet out there. He's going blindfolded. He's got a, about a crowd of about 20,000 people. And he says, who thinks I could put a man in a wheelbarrow and go across? I'm like, yes. Right? And he says, who wants to go first? Nobody wants to go. And the part I want to get to is that it's, faith is not me learning to, to walk on the tightrope. But faith is what his manager did. His manager said, okay, fine. I believe that you can do it. I believe that you could put a man in a wheelbarrow because I know how good you are. I know how talented that you are. And I trust you. So the manager didn't have to do anything except trust and get on his back. He got on his back. And that's essentially what God is saying. Abraham, hey, guess what? We're going we're gonna to do, do this tightrope. Okay. I mean, I couldn't do that. I know. Get on my back. Okay. I'll get on your back. That's what the faith is. We get on God's back and let him do the work. It's his work. It's not our work. But it's his goodness. He's gracious enough to carry us from this side to that side. And he says, just get on my back and just hold on. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to add to what I'm doing. The manager did not help Charles Blondin cross. He simply got on and was still and rested and said, I believe you can do this. I might shut my eyes, but I'm going to let you do it. That's what I would have done. But he was convinced, Abraham was convinced that God could do what he said. And so it was that faith in God's goodness and God's grace that he was saved and not through the keeping of the Torah. 
Now, is there a place for the Torah? Yes. Because when we follow its instructions, it leads to goodness. It leads to life. But the reality is we've all fallen off the cliff one way or another. Big sins, little sins, it doesn't really matter. You might be standing here looking at the cliff. You're like, yeah, that's a bad idea. And then a big strong wind comes and just blows you over. And you're like, ah, oh, I shouldn't have gotten that close. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to jump. I'm not, this wasn't what I had in mind. But you're falling nevertheless. You're falling either way. Maybe somebody kind of helped you over the cliff. You're still falling. You still need someone to save you. God hasn't changed. It's always been by his grace. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised to our, of our, raised because of our justification. We're simply believing, just like Abraham, who said, I'm going to make your descendants like the stars of the sky. We're believing in God said, I made a way for you to have eternal life through Yeshua. And we're like, okay, I believe it. If we don't have to add to it, what we do to be righteous is not going to add to what he already did. I encourage you, try to be righteous. Go for it. Study the word. Learn it. Put it in your heart and do those things because they're good. But at the end of the day, when you look back on your day and you say, you know, I, I think I got eight out of ten right, but I still bombed in those two. And the closer you get to the Lord, what happens is the more he turns the lights up, the brighter it gets. You know, I look really dashing and ravishing when the lights are low. I look at myself in the mirror, I'm like, man, good looking. But then I turn the lights up and I'm like, oh, not so good anymore. Turn them down, right? But that's what God's light does to us. The closer we get to him, the brighter it gets. And so many of the sins that we didn't see in dim lighting suddenly become visible. And so the closer we get to him, the longer we walk with him, the more we're going to begin to see those, those other little flaws. I'm supposing most of us here are not guilty of the, the big sins like murder. Well, you wouldn't be here probably. But it's, as we get closer, he begins to shine that light in our heart. He says, oh yeah, well check this out. How about that, that pride or that arrogance that you have? Oh, yeah. And you begin to see it. So I don't think that any of us will get through our life and suddenly say, man, I've arrived. God got all the stuff out of me. You'll keep seeing stuff. And so that's why we keep going back to his grace. And so as God revealed himself to Moses, he revealed the most important thing. The Lord, the Lord the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in loyal love and faithfulness, keeping loyal love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Your mess up is on that list. Don't think that you can come and you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, from now on I'm gonna do everything right and God's gonna accept me. That's not how it works. That's a fool's errand, if that's what you're thinking. You're like, I'm going to get into the, the messianic thing. We're going to keep the law. We're going to do it right. Yeah, good luck. I encourage keeping the law, because it's better for you. You're better quality of life. But not enough to save yourself in God's sight. When I stand before him, I'm going to say, Lord, I'm here because of your grace. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to be obedient. I wanted to, to do the things you told me to do, but I know that I failed. I know that in my own heart there's wickedness. I know that in my own heart there's, there's darkness. And so I thank you that you saved me by your goodness and your grace. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, you're good. We are glad for your grace. We're glad that it's by faith in you that we're made right. Not by our own actions. 
Yes, Lord, help us to, to live according to your word, to do those things you say to do, because they're good, and they're true, and they're righteous, and they're pure. But we also know that our relationship with you is not predicated on those things. It's not, we, we, we don't find favor with you because of those things. Or we're not saved from our sins because of those. It's, it's your grace. So thank you. Thank you for the law. Thank you for the righteous standard that you revealed to us and you wrote down and put it on the fridge. Thank you for that. But also thank you that when we were falling, you made a way and you put that big hand out so that we, we could be saved. We love you and praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen. If you would please stand. The Lord God who loves you has an amazing blessing for you. Yevarech Adonai veyishmerecha Yae Adonai pana velecha vichunecha Yisa Adonai pana velecha veyesem lecha shalom The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make his face shine upon you and will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you and will give you peace. Shem Yeshua Meshichin, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. God bless. God bless. Shabbat Shalom. The wedding will start later. <laughs> what? One o'clock? Some. We're gonna do is we're gonna change over the set as it were. Um, should take about fifteen twenty minutes and.